first lecture for college algebra. And we're going to go into some sort of some basics, sort of what equations are and then how we go from equations to graphing and then some ways of well, why do we want to graph. Well, first off, let's look at equations. Equations, we want to think in terms of input and output. We're going to take some kind of input, we're going to put it into some function that does something, and it gives us an output. So let's take a look at this. Well, what's going on here? We have an input, x. We put a number for x, say we choose 10. We get 3 times 10, which is 30. We add 2, we've got 32. So the output's going to be 32. So this is our idea of equations. Now, typically what we do is we try to keep track of the input and the output, and we call this an ordered pair. And what we do in an ordered pair, the input is always first, and the output is always last. So the input is x and the output is y. So for us, in this case, since we chose 10 as an input, we got an output of 32. Our x comma y is 10, 32. The order is always going to stay this way. What we started with, 10, what came out, 32. Now, there's another term for this, another set of terms. The input for x. We're free to choose x. Now, there are some restrictions, and we'll talk about that later in class. But for the most part, we're free to choose x. So we call this the independent variable. Now the output, it's a result of what we chose from the input and what we did to the input. So the output depends on our choice of x and what the function's doing to it. So the y is the dependent variable. Now, We'll oftentimes talk about the solution to an equation. The solution to an equation is an ordered pair, an x comma y. And by the way, we call x and y coordinates. So you'll hear the x coordinate or the y coordinate. But it's an ordered pair of x and y coordinates that work. So because they work, they're going to satisfy the equation. So what does this mean? Well, let me show you. Let's go back to this. Well, let's say we take the ordered pair 
one and five. One and five. So what we're going to do, we're going to substitute. We're going to replace the x with one and the y with five. We're going to see if this equality sign still makes sense. It's still true. Let's see. So y will be five. Three times one plus two. Well, is this actually true? Sometimes I'll put a question mark or the equal sign if I'm still trying to figure out if this is actually correct. Well, sure enough, five is equal to five. So one comma five is a solution to that equation. Now let's try another one. Is this going to be a solution? Well, let's find out. Is seven equal to three times two plus two? Well, is seven equal to six plus two? Well, here we go. Six plus two is eight. Is that correct? Not true. This is false. So what this means is that two comma seven is not a solution to this equation. It doesn't work. Now, oftentimes we want to characterize an equation. And what we can do is we can come up with a whole bunch of ordered pairs. And this is what I call XY chart. So we're going to try to sort of understand or get a sense of what this equation is doing with the inputs. So let's say we do this. Choose a bunch of inputs. We'll have our outputs. And these will be the ordered pairs we derive from this equation by putting in inputs and collecting outputs. So let's say we have this. So when x is negative 2, what do we get for an output? We get y is 3 times negative 2. We we'll use parentheses for multiplication this time plus two, and that comes out to so that's negative six plus two, negative four. Now we're going to let x be negative one. So y will be three times negative one plus two, negative three plus two, negative one. Oh, well, that's interesting. Put in negative one, you get negative one. Let's try zero. So three times zero is zero, zero plus two is two. And then one. Three times one is three, plus two is five. And finally, x is two. Three times two is six, six plus two is eight. So we've got our outputs for each input. So we gather these up in ordered pairs. It's kind of a neat one how that turned out.
So taking a look at these, does this give us a sense of what this equation is doing? Now, sometimes we're not dealing with equations to get our ordered pairs. Sometimes we're just getting data. For example, we could be recording the temperature outside our door every half hour of the day, or maybe every minute of the day. And we don't know the equation that turns a moment of time into a temperature. We're not sure how that works. Probably very complicated, maybe impossibly complicated to be perfectly accurate. But we can get an input time and an output temperature. So we might not have this part. You just have the input, we might have the outputs, and then we just have ordered pairs. So if we just look at these ordered pairs, especially for dealing with data, does this give an idea of what's going on? And you might see some patterns here if, as the inputs are increasing from negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. Inputs are getting bigger and bigger. Negatives, zero, positive numbers. Well, the outputs are negative, and then they're positive, and then they're bigger positive. So it looks like as the inputs increase, the outputs increase. So there's something we can see right away. But beyond that, it might be kind of tricky. So there's another approach to this. I'm going to say this. You know how a picture is worth a thousand words? I'm going to say a graph is worth a thousand order pair. A graph is worth a thousand ordered pairs. So what this means is we can draw a picture of this and get a really good sense of what's going on maybe a better sense of what's going on by other than just looking at the ordered pairs. So let's talk about how you graph an equation. So we use something called the Cartesian coordinate system. And it's composed of two number lines that intersect at the zeros. So number lines, they're negative numbers, zero, positive numbers. We're going to have two of them cross each other at their zeros. The first one we call the x-axis. And then the vertical one, the second one, that's the y-axis. And where they cross, call this the origin. Now, we also divide this into coordinates. We call this upper left one the first coordinate, or quadrant rather. We call this the second quadrant. This is the third quadrant. And that's the fourth quadrant. Quadrants starting here go counterclockwise. Now, the way we graph something, we can think about it using two methods. So let me show you the first method. I call this the method of intersection. So let's say we're going to graph or plot. Two comma one. Now remember, x coordinate is always first, y coordinate always second.
All right. So first off, here's our x coordinate, x equals two, and we've got this y coordinate, y equals one. Now you might recall from algebra vertical and horizontal lines. X equals two means we put a vertical line through X equals two. And then if you recall Y equals one, well that means a horizontal line through y equals 1. And where these two intersect, the vertical line and the horizontal line, that is our point. So that's one way we can graph this point. Now, most people do it the second method, or I call the walk from origin method. And again, we're going to graph. comma one. So what we do, again, we have x is 2 and y is 1. So what this means, we're going to start from the origin. And we're going to walk out to whatever the x value is. So if x is negative 3, we'd walk out to negative 3. But since x is 2, we're going to walk out to 2 instead. Next, we're going to move vertically. Now, we don't move diagonally, we don't move in circles, we only really move two ways, horizontally or vertically. So now we're going to move vertically. Now, y is y. So we're going to move up vertically to y is 1. And where we stop, That's our point, 2 comma 1. Now, if y was, say, negative 3, we had 2 comma negative 3. When we got out to here, we would go vertically down to y is negative 3, and then that would be our point. But in this case, y was 1, so we go up to y is 1, and we're done. So that's how we can plot points. So. If we want to come up with a picture of our equation, well, what we can do is plot the ordered pairs, and that might give us a better picture of well, what's going on. What is this equation actually doing? Or if we're collecting data, we don't know how the output is being derived from the input. We can at least get a picture of what kind of relationship does exist, like what's going on even though we don't know why it's happening. So let's graph that equation. So again, and you can flip back in the video and see uh, what, how we derived the ordered pairs, but the ordered pairs we came up with, negative two, let's see, negative four, negative one, negative one, I still think that's cool. 
zero comma two, squeeze that in there, one comma five, and two comma eight. So now we're going to plot all these points and see what we get. I'm going out to eight. Up here to negative eight. Also the negative eight. And so now we're going to plot our points. So we have negative 2 for x, negative 4 for y. So I'm going to use the origin method. I'm going to come out to negative 2, drop down to negative 4. And then for this one, come out to negative 1, drop down to negative 1. Now this is 0 and 2. So when we start at the origin, that's where x equals 0. So we don't have to go anywhere horizontally. We're already there. But we do need to go up to y is 2. And then go out to 1, up to 5, and then out to 2, up to 8. I think that's accurate. I'm going to connect the dots. Pardon some artistic license on my part. Terrible drawing straight lines. But there you go. That's a very wobbly picture of our line. But we can see as we go from smaller values of x to bigger values of x, this thing is rising. And barring artistic license, it's going to be a relatively smooth line. It should be a perfectly smooth line, actually. But this picture gives us an idea of what this equation is doing. And if we're dealing with data, again, where we don't know what the equation is, well, we don't need to know what the equation is to determine what kind of relationship our input has with our output. As long as we have the input recorded and the output, we can plot those points, connect them, and that'll give us some idea what's going on. So let's say we have this. Let's say we're doing our temperatures. And we can say this is say 24 hours. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Ooh, I'm gonna run out of space. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Yikes. Squeeze in that 24. 9, 10, 11, 12, squeeze in the 12. So let's just focus on this half of the graph. And okay, let's have some temperatures though. Let's say 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. So what we can do we can think of the temperature. We're not going to have any negative temperatures. We're going to ignore, just say this is in the summertime. And we're not going to think about negative hours. I'm just going to focus on, say, this is midnight, noon, midnight the next day. So let's say the temperature starts at 60 degrees. And it's going to rise, rise, and it's about 100 degrees around 1, 2, 3 o'clock. And then it drops down pretty quickly. 
back to 60. So let's say we get this graph using data. We connect all these little points. So we check the hour, record the temperature. So what can we get from this graph? Well, we don't know the equation that gave us these points that we've all connected here. But we can still learn something about the relationship between time and temperature. So it starts out about 60 degrees at midnight. And then it slowly rises. And then we hit a maximum, looks like a little over 100, sometime, let's see, noon, 1, 2, 3, 4 o'clock. And then on this particular day, it drops pretty quickly back down to 60. So some observations we can make. Well, the temperature increases from zero hours to, and this is 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 hours. Or three o'clock. There's a maximum temp around 15 to 16. That's a one, two, three, four, yeah, 15 to 16 hours. So you need a maximum. And then after 16, it drops. So we can see where it's increasing. We can see where there's a maximum. We can see where it's decreasing. So the power of graphing points, and we say, again, we had all these little points that we were graphing here when we connected them. And again, let's say we're just getting this off a machine or a thermometer. Check your watch, check the thermometer, record a point. Thermometer, watch, watch thermometer, watch thermometer, watch thermometer. We don't know the relationship between what we see on the watch and what we see on the thermometer, but we don't need to. We can still take a picture of that relationship using ordered pairs and putting them on a graph. And then we can look at this graph and boom, we can see clearly what's going on without having to scan those ordered pairs. Sometimes we can see certain properties about this relationship between time and temperature much easier using the graph instead of looking at the actual ordered pairs if we have them listed out. So just something to keep in mind. All right. So they talk about something in this section called a mathematical model. And what a model does, it describes something we can observe in the world. Or it describes a phenomenon. Let me check my spelling there. I don't want to spell words wrong with phenomenon. It is an O. There we go. Phenomenon. So describe some phenomenon or phenomena. That's probably the proper way. This is plural. Getting a little bit of a grammar lesson today. It can describe phenomenon or a phenomenon, single relationships, say, or some single observation. And it's usually some kind of equation that does this. 
So a famous model you've probably seen before equals mc squared. It describes theoretically the energy that could theoretically be derived from mass. So the input in this one is going to be m. Now you might argue, well, what about c? Isn't c a, a, a variable too? And I'd say, well, kind of. It's actually a constant. Here, let me get the exact value of c. It's the speed of light in a vacuum. And I guess we don't have to always be writing that number. We symbolize it using c. So this will always have the same value. It will not be variable or varying. So we don't think of this as a variable. But this, we're free to choose. We can't choose this. But this we can choose. So this becomes our input or our variable, independent variable. Let me get a good accurate number for c. So we're looking for the speed of light in a vacuum. And I'm really going to estimate this. It's about 2.99 times 10 to the 8. I think in my face to face class, I just said 3 times 10 to the 8. We'll call it good enough. Oh, OK, we'll do that. Any of you who are physics minded might be really concerned about this approximation because theoretically you cannot exceed the speed of light, not even by a little bit. So taking it, we're just making the calculation easy, but you can't this. I don't think this is a good estimation. You don't want to ever be higher than the speed of light. So this is our input. This is our output. So if we input a value for mass, let me throw in our very dubious speed of light numbers. We multiply these together and get the output for energy. So my mass is probably about 100 kilograms. But let's let m equal 100 kilograms. So how much energy theoretically is within me? It's mass only. Well, put in our 100 times our terrible approximation for the speed of light. Exponent first. Get nine times 10, 16. So times 100, that gives you nine times 10 to 18, which is a ton of energy. To give you an idea of what that could be, I believe that's about the amount of energy in a hydrogen bomb, like a fairly sizable one. So a lot of energy if you can somehow get it out of the mass or turn the mass into energy. But this is a model. It, it gives us a picture of how the universe works, or some little part of the universe. And like any of the other equations, you could graph this. You could pick different values for them and see how they change and how much energy you get. So the last thing I want to mention is what we call graphing windows. And you'll run into this with graphing calculators. You might see, for example, the typical graphing window. Very common for graphing calculators. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, negative eight, negative nine, negative ten. I think that's right. Space these a little better. And then 
negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8, negative 9, negative 10. Now, the way they set this up in Windows, how to do this, and the way the book describes it, for the x-axis, we're going to say it goes from negative 10 the 10 and the tick marks, oh, sorry, not two, one. Every unit, we get a tick mark. It'll be the same for the y-axis. Negative 10 to 10 and every unit, we get a tick mark. Now, let's say we change things. Let's do this. Well, the x-axis hasn't changed. Negative 10 to 10, but a tick mark every unit. But we've done something to the y-axis. It's not going from negative 10 to 10. It's now going negative 8 to 10. And there's a tick mark, not every single unit, every two units. So that's how you would describe this window your x-axis and your y-axis. So that's going to be it for tonight. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm going to be posting the next video shortly. Um, but again, any questions about this, um, you can get a hold of me of office hours. And since you're taking the online class, I have online office hours where I'm in front of the board like this. Um, I put my post in my office hours. You can see those. Just click on the link, and I'll have that link open during office hours so you can see a presentation like this. And um, if that doesn't work for you, let me know. I can set up an appointment, and we can meet during the appointment time, again, using this scenario here. So other than that, hope things are going good, and I'll see you next time.